How did they pass the Union? By perjury and fraud. By slaves who sold their land for gold, as Judas sold his God. And thus they passed the Union by pit and castle ray. Could Satan send for such an end more worthy tools than they? That was a poem that was written in the late 19th century that was taught in many Irish schools right up until the 1960s. A very emotive poem which captured how many Irish people felt about the passing of the Irish Act of Union in 1800 and the abolition of the Irish Parliament. And in a way, the Act of Union created the matrix for modern Irish history. It created the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, which then became, after Irish independence, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It created a new flag for the British Empire, the Union Jack. And it created many of the subsequent divisions in Irish history, because for Unionists, it became the thing that they would cling close to, tightly to, and they would fight to protect. For Irish nationalists, it became the thing that must be overthrown, a corrupt event that had shamed the Irish nation and which must be overturned no matter what the cost. And some of the ironies about the Act of Union is that the Orange Order, which had been established in 1795 to defend the Protestant ascendancy, to defend Protestant loyalists, actually opposed the Act of Union in 1799 and 1800. Uh, it didn't have an official position, but most of its members opposed it, precisely because they wanted to keep an Irish Parliament that would protect the rights of the Protestant ascendancy. And Catholic Ireland was by and large divided by the Union because some held out the hope that Catholic emancipation, all of their political rights, would come with it. Now, the advice that Edward Cook, the very influential Castle Undersecretary, gave to the British government in 1798 was that if they were serious about a union, it should be written up, sung up, spoken up, bribed up and drunk up meaning that they should use their money to make sure they could get people on side, get people to write songs in favour of it, get people to write pamphlets in favour of it, encourage support for it. The trouble was that the British state was pretty bankrupt. It was fighting a very costly war with France. It couldn't afford to use all of these measures. Uh, and so it tried to bring in the Union in 1799 as cheaply as possible. I'll give you one example. Many people in the Irish Parliament consider their seats as kind of like property because of the 300 seats, only about 82 were directly elected by any kind of large number of people. The rest you could buy. Henry Grattan, when he returned to Parliament in 1800, purchased a seat for £8,000. So people didn't want to vote out of existence those seats uh, because then they lost this income that would come in every time there was a general election. So you would have to give these people compensation. But the government didn't want to do that in 1799 because they estimated it would come to about a quarter of a million pounds and that was just way too expensive. The Catholic question was a troublesome one because Pitt originally had the idea of accompanying the Union with Catholic emancipation, but when he invited over leading members of the Irish administration to discuss this in the autumn of 1798, they made it very clear that if emancipation was part of the Union terms, they would set themselves at the head of the opposition and they would make sure it was defeated. And so Pitt reluctantly, but being a, a shrewd calculating politician, gave it up. Catholic emancipation would not become part of the Union, but something that could be perhaps introduced at a later stage. So they were the two big weaknesses of the Union as it moved towards 1799. There was no money to be spent on gaining support. They weren't going to compensate people losing their seats. And also, they weren't doing anything to get the Catholics on side. And you might ask, why does it matter if the Catholics are on side? After all, there wasn't a single Catholic in the Irish House of Commons and that's where it would have to pass and then in the House of Lords. Well, even though there weren't any Catholics there, Catholics were still the voters and Catholics had huge influence over the, the seats where they did have uh, open seats where people would be elected. But also Catholics were eight tenths of the population and the Parliament was very reluctant to go against the wishes of the large majority of the people because there could be another rebellion. 
there could be more violence. And so the support, the views of the Catholic majority actually were meaningful and they actually did count for something. So between May 1798 and December 1798, Pitt and his ministers worked with key figures in the Irish administration to work on passing this union. And they liaised with Cornwallis, who is now the Lord Lieutenant, uh, the person who have to direct this, and also their chief minister, Lord Castlereagh. Now, he was a very young man. He had only gotten the job in 1798 because his uncle was the previous Lord Lieutenant, Lord Camden. So in a way, family influence had given him his job. And he was the minister then who was going to be in charge of bringing this forward in the House of Commons. Uh, and so the scene was set for not the introduction of the Union in January 1799, but the reading of the King's Address on the 22nd of January, where Union was going to be mentioned in a paragraph. And that's where the opposition decided to strike. Because there was just not support amongst the Irish political elite for it. Why would you vote yourself out of existence? They loved having an Irish Parliament. It was great fun. There was a casino right next door with a tunnel connecting the casino to the, uh, to the parliament. And it had a bell so that when the bell would ring, you, know, you knew a vote was going to be called. You could have food and drinks in the casino. It was great fun. Having a parliament in Dublin also gave you an opportunity to go to the city, have a, have a, have a, have a house in Dublin. Uh, there was a great prestige attached to being a member of the Irish parliament. And there were 300 of them. If you vote that out of existence, there'll only be a hundred and you'll have to go to London and it won't be as much fun. And there was no real incentive to do it. The government wasn't offering any jobs for people uh, in return for it. Although people who were on the government benches like Sir John Parnell, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer in Ireland, when he said he wouldn't oppose it, he was fired. But really, those punishments came too late to scare the government supporters into backing the measure. So when the Union paragraph was read out in the King's Address on the 22nd of January, there really was not very much public support for it. Certainly there wasn't any support either in that chamber. And Lord Castlereagh, this young minister who was there to bring it forward, was assailed from all sides by people attacking this measure. And they made fun of him because he was, well, he was married and he'd been married a number of years. He had no children. So they accused him of being impotent. They said, look at this green and, and unassuming stripling. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a useless person. This person is no good. He was abused, he was assailed. Now, Cassere was not normally a very good speaker. He tended to speak in a monotone. He could be quite boring, except when he was roused by a passion. And then he would come alive and he would defend the cause. And he came alive in that debate and delivered a brilliant defence of the Union. But it was no use. And they voted an amendment to remove the Union paragraph from the King's Address. And that was a stunning victory uh, for the anti-Union side. And they, uh, they celebrated by lighting bonfires in Dublin. And uh, they went around breaking the windows of the houses of the MPs who had supported the union and any of the government officials. And it was said that the bonfires actually threatened to spread across the city and put the city entirely up in flames, except it rained that night. The Irish weather coming to the rescue. And, and so the bonfires did not spread. But that gives an indication of... Uh, just what the popular mood was when they thought the Union would be defeated. But of course, the Union was not really defeated permanently. It was only the first attempt at it. And so they decided in Britain they would have to try again. They would try again in 1800, but now they would plan carefully. They would lay the groundwork. They would do whatever was necessary to succeed and they would learn from the failures of 1799. And in fact, they thought about sacking Cornwallis and Castlereagh and replacing them with a new Lord Lieutenant and a new Chief Secretary. But in the end, they decided to keep them because it would be a bit too messy to fire them and then bring new people over. The new people would have to learn uh, how the Irish system worked. And so they decided to give them one more chance. But, Everything that the government had failed to do in 1799, they now changed their mind on. So when we ask, how did they pass the union? 
Well, you really need to look at three things. And those three things are the three C's. Corruption, the Catholic question, and compensation. And to deal with that third one first, compensation. I mentioned that so many of these, uh, not only the MPs, but also the owners of these seats saw them as property. They could get five to eight thousand pounds every time there was an election. They had to be compensated. So immediately following the defeat in January 1799, borough compensation was conceded. The government decided that any seat that was going to be abolished, well, the owner would get money. So it could be 20 to 30 thousand pounds. And what that meant was that a lot of the borough owners, these aristocrats who owned a number of seats, they were vehemently against the union in 1799, but now they didn't really care so much because they were going to get money in return. And what that also meant was that some MPs could be persuaded to vacate their seats and then you would bring in an MP who would vote the other way. And that's also what happened. So uh, that brings us on to the issue of corruption. Because how do you persuade an MP to change sides? How do you persuade an MP, if he doesn't want to change sides, to vacate his seat and allow someone else to come in? Well, it's not all corruption in the sense that we would see it. You have some legal means. For example, there are a lot of good jobs that are going. There are jobs in Dublin Castle like taster of wines. Now, that seems like a nice job in itself, but it also carries an annual income of £300. What you do is you tell someone, I will make you keeper of wines in Dublin Castle. We'll get an annual salary of £300. All you have to do is support the union. Technically, there was nothing illegal about that, according to the conventions of the time, because these jobs were how the government always built up their majorities. So a number of MPs were persuaded to switch sides or vacate their seats because of promises like that. The problem was there was only a limited number of jobs like that that you could offer people. So what would you do about the rest? And that's where direct bribery was involved because the government raised a sum of £63,000 which they would use as bribes. And uh, some of that was secret service money that was going into Ireland ostensibly to detect conspiracies and treasonous activity, but was then being redirected into the government monies to use to support the union. And some of it could be used on things like uh, you would go to lawyers and ask them to write pamphlets uh, in favour of the union and give them a few thousand pounds for it. And many of them were only too happy to oblige. Uh, William Hancock was an, an MP for Athlone who wrote and sang songs against the union in 1799. He wrote and sang songs in favour of the union uh, in 1800 and he received a good reward afterwards. And the, the, the cash payments that were handed over were ways of keeping these supporters happy until a legal route was found afterwards, like making them taster of the wines at Dublin Castle. They also used the money to buy up the opposition pamphlets. And Edward Cook, the great organiser of the Dublin Castle uh, strategy, uh, he would buy up these pamphlets and then hold big bonfires in Dublin Castle where they would burn all of these pamphlets all together. So this was great for morale, for the unionists, because they used to have big dinners on the nights of the debates. They would pass around the, the wine very freely. The MPs would get a bit drunk. And then they would find that when they would send them off to speak in favour of the union, well, not only were they prepared to do it because they had been bought to vote that way, the drink also meant that they were much more lively and boisterous than they would have been otherwise. And so the people who had remained silent in 1799 or who had been on the other side in 1799 were now shouting and speaking and, and fighting in favour of the Union in 1800. So a lot changed between 1799 and 1800. And the other key one is the Catholic question, because the government decided that they could not pass the union if Catholic Ireland was opposed to it. And so they decided that Catholic emancipation would accompany it. And they gave permission to Cornwallis and Castlereagh to tell the Catholic bishops that this was the case and to make a public declaration that the union would come with emancipation if the union held was, was in the balance. Now, they never made that 
promised public because they wanted emancipation to be to appear as a gift of the British government, not as something that had been traded. But it did mean that they were able to go to the bishops and tell them of this deal. And as a result, the bishops were able to tell the priests. And that is why the majority of the Catholic bishops and the majority of the Catholic priests supported the Union in 1800. And that was why young Catholic leaders like Daniel O'Connell came into prominence in 1800 by trying to show that Catholic Ireland was not in favour of the Union. And that was why 1800 and the first six months of 1800 became the scene of some of these heated debates where they tried to show inside and outside of Parliament what the Union was about, why it should pass or be rejected and what the active Union would mean for Ireland.